everyone. Welcome, welcome on in. We are getting started here. We are uh, so happy to have you and thank you for those of you who are joining us live this evening. We are going to have a great time and thank you for tuning in today's panel with some incredible folks working in our community to make our outdoor spaces more welcoming and more inclusive for all. My name is Rebecca Ratcliffe. I am the Outreach Associate here for the Deschutes Land Trust and I'll be doing my best to facilitate our discussion this evening. As a reminder, our panelists will be the only folks with mics on during this time. This will help us hear them clearly and will also help us focus in on listening. So thank you for keeping that in mind as you join us today. Then following this event, we will be sharing the ways that you can connect with our panelists, additional information and resources of all kinds. So don't worry if you miss an interesting tidbit or something along those lines, we'll be able to follow up after the fact. We do have a shorter time window this evening, so uh, we won't be going completely into depth with things, but hopefully you'll have some ideas getting sparked and be able to uh, connect further on and have further conversations. So without further ado and, and understanding that we have this short amount of time, I would like to uh, ask our, our panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves this evening. Uh, you can share a connection or reason that you love the outdoors. Um, so just tell us a bit about yourself. Um, for ease of discussion, I'll go ahead and call on folks, but Zavi, would you like to, to start us off? I'd love to. Um, yeah, my name is Xavier Borja. I usually just go by Zavi. Um, pronouns he, him, el. And I've grown up in the Central Oregon area most of all of my life. Grew up in Madras, live in Bend now for about eight, nine years. Um, I feel like I've always been connected to nature, to outdoor spaces, um, just helping my dad water the plants or, you know, stay, I used to spend a lot of time at my grandparents' place and they live out in Eastern Oregon, out like by an orchard. And so I would spend a lot of time just like running around the orchard, like with my cousins and like hanging around with them and just climbing trees. And I think for me at a young age, that was like my introduction and or like how I got connected to nature. But yeah, thank you for being, I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Zavi. Uh, next up, maybe Jamie. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamie Nesbitt. I'm president of Out Central Oregon. Uh, Out Central Oregon is a nonprofit that's based here in Bend. Uh, it's about two and a half years old, and we basically are focused on advocacy, inclusivity, and visibility of the LGBTQ community here in Bend and in Central Oregon. Uh, my love of the outdoors stems from the time I was a kid. I grew up in a small town in Maine of about 5,000 people. There wasn't really much to do other than be outside and be outdoors um, and that's just carried on through my entire life i lived in urban areas from college on until five years ago when my partner and i moved here to, to central oregon um, i think the draw to central oregon really is it's outdoors people stay here move here and vacation here because of the beauty and the surrounding area um, and i i think that is definitely i fall into that category completely I'm really happy to be here tonight with everybody. Thank you, uh, Gordon. Yes, hi, uh, I'm Gordon Price. Uh, I work at COCC right now uh, and have been for quite a while. Um, I've been in Central Oregon since the early 2000s. So seeing the girls, seeing the change. Um, Really great to be here. I did move away back home. I grew up in Washington, D.C. And so what, talking to Zavi or hearing jo Zavi and Jamie's story about growing up, I grew up in the city in the concrete jungle, but I still always had a, an affinity for nature. I would find Rock Creek Park or, you know, I was fortunate to find the creek that ran behind the house and you'd find me, you know, climbing the trees or skipping rocks. And so I always had that nature as an escape, but I didn't really fully get into it until I moved out west uh, uh, when I was a young man, about 25. And so um, have been out in Central Oregon for the last 20 years and truly enjoy the area we have here and the opportunities that we have. And uh, when we moved back for a couple of years to D.C., we quickly moved back within a year and a half to realizing that we missed Central Oregon and the, uh, and the opportunities that we have here uh, and the, the nature that we have here. So I'm glad to be here tonight and share my story as well. Thanks, Gordon. Great to have you. Great to see you. Judith? Good. 
Hello, happy to be here. Um, name is Judith Sedora. I am, um, pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I am actually a wilderness therapist. Uh, so I work for a program here in Bend, um, working with adolescent boys uh, out in the woods, doing mental health, providing mental health services. Um, I actually primarily, I work with adolescent boys, but my niche and my specificity is working with adolescent boys of color. And so I love my love, love my job. Um, I also have a private practice here in Redmond. And so that's what I do part time. Uh, what draws me to the outdoors? Um, based on narratives, what, based on narratives, I feel like I've always been connected to nature in a lot of ways, whether I was um, consciously aware of it at the level that I am right now. Um, but yeah, I'm from the city. I was born and raised in North born and raised in Jersey, lived upstate New York for a while. Um, then I lived in Vegas. And then I lived in a really small town of like 100 people where there's ranchers. And then I'm here in Central Oregon. So I have seen a plethora of different places <laughs> based on population. And so in that, I've just been in touch with nature um, in many different ways. So na yeah, nature has different meanings for me. Um, super happy to be in Central Oregon. I think it's beautiful. Um, and I've been here for about a year and a half now. I moved here last year of March, and so I like it. Glad to have you here and here, here. Yeah, welcome, dear. Next up, we'll jump over to Ashley. Hi, I'm Ashley Schaefer. Uh, she, her is my pronouns. Um, I am a disability consultant and advocate and designer, um, usually around the outdoor recreation kind of sector and built environment, indoors, outdoors. Um, I've been in a wheelchair, well, wheelchair user for about 19 years now. Uh, so my kind of relationship with the outdoors has changed a lot over the years. Um, and now it's really a space where I can push my, my physical limits and my limits are, are very different um, and I can kind of redefine what my physical limits are in the outdoors and so it really provides a relief and you know empowering the, the things that it all it provides for you but in a different way. Thanks for having me. Thank you Ashley. We'll jump over to Kelly. Hi, my name is Kelly Standish. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I work for Oregon Adaptive Sports. I've worked with them for five years now, um, which has been a really awesome experience, a lot of learning. Um, and I have always been connected to the outdoors. I grew up in Seattle area, so always on the water, out in the trees, playing outside. Um, and then when I moved to Bend five-ish years ago, I started really pursuing their more recreational avenues and. Um, but I just love being outside. I feel connected to myself. I feel connected to others when I get to spend time outside. So find a lot of joy there. And I've been really fortunate that I get to share that joy with other people. Thanks, Kelly. And, and thanks all. I, I know that introductions can always be kind of funny, but it's great to know that, you know, we're all people coming to this place at this time um, in a time that is kind of crazy. So uh, thank you all for being here. I'm excited to jump into discussion so I can take a back seat and, and hear all of your thoughts and experiences and stories. And I, I think other folks are as well. We've come to this conversation because we wanna learn how to make the outdoors truly for all. Um, but I think it might be important to take a step back and start with this first question is, what is one way that your experience is different from the personal experiences of others in the outdoors? This could be, a positive thing that maybe you take for granted, uh, or this could be any piece that you'd like to share about your personal experiences with the outdoors. Is, is there anyone that would like to jump in on that question? I'll jump in. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I'll break the crickets. Um, yeah, so good question. Um, uh, let's see. One thing I, so me being a, a black woman, I identify myself as black, Haitian American. Um, 
and being outdoors and being a part of nature, especially as I've moved from different areas in um, the country, it's definitely has taken a lot of different forms. Um, and coming to Central Oregon, there in my field, in my work, and also in my own personal life, I have had to navigate and um, conceptualize the fact that nature looks very different out here. There is a narrative to what it looks like in terms of the way that you dress, in the terms of the language that you use, um, and what's practiced out here. And so often find, oftentimes I find myself in spaces where I'm like, this is not how I do nature. I mean, nature doesn't look like this for me necessarily. Um, I'm from the city, I'm a Caribbean woman. I have a lot of expression and culture and such, and I wear different things. And so um, there has been times where I have gone, I could just recently, I went on a backpacking trip with um, two really amazing women in the community, women of color and, you know, the way that we express and show ourselves in nature is different from what traditionally we have seen. And even in that, we were experiencing some very um, unfortunate um, situations and interactions with people on the trail or people um, camping next to us. And, and oftentimes it leaves you feeling like, oh, I'm not following the norms, whatever those norms have been and set up in society and culture. And so it makes you feel like you're not welcome because you don't practice the way that we see specifically cent or Oregon people, right? <laughs> um, practice or we don't look or we don't dress or et cetera, et cetera. And so that is something that I've navigated and have to continue navigating is that I'm going to be okay coming out into the field or coming out into wilderness or nature on the trails looking very different and accepting that even though other people may not accept that. So that's one perspective. I think just kind of going off that, thank you for sharing, is um, a lot of stuff like to that narrative point is very new to me. Like, I think I do a lot of work within the outdoors and I don't know if there's a perception like I know how to do a lot of these. Like, I think Ben tends to be a bit like extreme, um, like summoning South Sister, like, you know, doing a, a marathon, doing the pole pedal paddle, which are all like great things. Um, but again, like that's not like what I grew up like in nature or like my outdoor experience. Um, and not a lot of people resonate with that. And that is also okay. Um, so again, my transition from like Madras, like a smaller town and like, um, quite frankly, like my, my father pretty much growing up would always like, that's not what we do. And I would ask like, you know, why can't like we do or I do something like that? Or like as a family, that just wasn't what we referring to like, you know, Latinos or like Mexicans like don't do. Um, and he would just, you know, again, frankly say that's what white people do. Um, so again, so me growing up, I would just be always kind of reinforced or told this thing that that's not like what I do and not what we do. Um, so just kind of almost believing that to an, to an extent, but when I moved here and then kind of seeing like, oh, I don't outdoors like this, or that doesn't look like my outdoors. Um, how can I fit in with like what I wear, what I, you know, and then trying to almost like code switch or figure out how to um, fit this mold that's, that's kind of perpetuated in Bend. Um, but then now for myself, taking a step back and trying to kind of not dismantle, but try to understand how can we find this happy medium or if there is and I think that's where like this inclusion conversation kind of comes into is how can we bring or meet folks where they're at and bring them into these spaces and make them and let them or allow them to feel fully authentic um I think one last point is just like stereotypically and or myself personally like you know Latinos tend to be very loud and I am a very loud person and we'd like to bring that like, outside or where we're going especially if we're going to be like with family or bring like other people with and around us and typically in the outdoors we want to preserve nature and like wildlife and like which is totally fine and I understand all those things um but again like being loud on the trail like being enjoying ourselves this is kind of how we ex express um and that's not okay again towards like the norm um so I guess that those are some way my experiences um Xavier can you explain what code switching is yeah thank you sorry <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you're good yeah code switching is just like trying to fit into, I don't even know how to explain it really. Uh, maybe you can. Um, just when I walk into a space, knowing that I cannot fully authentically bring myself into it. So I kind of have to gauge the room and kind of change my vocabulary, vernacular, my, what, how, I, how I dress, or I had to think these things through uh, potentially in order to feel comfortable or welcoming into that space. You know, that's something that even I'm trying to 
undo myself, you know, I, even the way I dress, because I've always felt for the longest time that I need to dress in these certain ways um, in order to feel or be accepted. And that's that code switch. I would do that in one setting versus like a family or like whatever setting. So it's like switching back and forth to these two different, almost like not alter egos, but like personas, I guess, of who I am or who I feel I need to be. So it's that walking in two worlds, right? And you have to, you have to walk that line and switch from one side to the other, depending on your situation or your audience or what group you're in. Yeah. We should have to, but right. That's, that's, the, that's what that, that's what that. Yeah. It's so interesting real quick with that. It's so interesting because sometimes we, we not sometimes I have, I have even realized that I have to code switch even amongst like the BIPOC community that I'm in because the term terminology, unfortunately in the narrative is black people don't do that. We don't do that. And then I'm sitting there like, but I want to do that. I know I'm black, but I want to do that. <laughs> I want to experience that. And so even that myself, I realized that I've had the code switch and navigate even within my community as it relates to connecting to the outdoors, connecting to nature in some ways too. Yeah, I can relate to that as well. Oh, go ahead, Ashley. Oh, I'm just saying I can relate to that as well. Like being in a wheelchair, I feel like I'm constantly doing that as well, even though I kind of fit the narrative of the outdoors, it's still not something that people expect to see me outside. Um, and so that's been a big challenge, just, you know, like you say, the competitiveness and the extreme nature of being in Bend and everything. And, you know, cause I do all the things, I bike, I climb, I ski both ways. And it's, it's definitely not what people expect. And I get a lot of comments of like, it's nice to see you out here or, or things that, you know, just, I'm so inspiring just because I show up and I do the same thing that everyone else does. And, you know, it's, it's weird, weird things like that where people are happy to see me, but they don't expect to see me. And so they're thrown off by it. And it's, it's that, that weird, like you're still the other kind of, kind of feeling outdoors that really can make it not as fun. And, you know, but that's how it is right now. Yeah, and I can I can flip uh, kind of on the other side of the spectrum from what Judith and, and Xavier had Xavier had said. I mean, I am white, cis, male. Um, I have all the privilege that comes with that for everything outdoors. Um, I don't take it for granted, but I do say that being part of the LGBT community growing up, I stayed away from sports that or outdoor activities that involve teams, for example. Um, because I was afraid of being an outsider or that I would be made fun of or ridiculed or whatever. And so I migrated to sports that were much more individualistic, such as hiking and skiing and, and that sort of thing. I mean, part of what Out Center Oregon is trying to do is, you know, we feel visibility is really important to bring diversity and inclusivity into various situations. And I think a lot of the stuff that we're doing with Winter Pride Fest, for example, and some of our other events are to get that visibility because i think that visibility is important for everybody to see i mean bend is you know skews very highly on the white on on, on white people um you're not going to see a large number of people of color on the trails just because the demographics here don't don't reflect that specifically but i think our efforts are really to ultimately get inclusivity and diversity um out there right i mean out there whether it's through the gays or, or anybody else um and that's part of what our efforts are about Thanks, Jamie. You know, I, I'd like to say if anyone else has anything else on that question, that we definitely have space. Otherwise, that leads us really well into our next question, which is kind of why we're here, right? We, we recognize these dis differences that we experience and we'd like to create a more inclusive, a more welcoming outdoors. So the next question is really, what's a way, what's one or two ways that, that you have thought of that the outdoors could become more inclusive? Well, for me, I think um, I thought a lot about this and going back to the other question, my first experience with racism as a young man was actually in the Boy Scouts and going camping. So it had a lot to do with the outdoors, right? I finally, I was 10 years old, 
fifth grade and the Boy Scouts and we were going on a great camping trip and it was an awful experience. I'm not going to take the time up, but so that's my introduction to the wilderness. And so I think when we talk about ways to make it more accessible or inclusive, the first thing I think we need to take a look at is acknowledging the history and why these situ why are we in this, why are we asking this question now, right? I was looking, I worked with the Deschutes National Forest a couple of weeks ago and I was doing research and came across these articles about uh, John Muir, right? And this conservation hero, right? But there's some flaws in there. And, and the, the, the conservation and time of that era was set up to exclude people of color, right? The lands that you are conserving now are Native American lands that were taken and, and given to other people, right? So acknowledging the history um, that has gotten us to this point where we now need to ask, how can we make it more inclusive? So the first part is acknowledging that, understanding that, using those as building blocks. Uh, and then the next question is, why do you want to make this an inclusive place? I think going back to understanding your why, right? I've heard this a lot. I've done a lot of these panels and conversations in the last few months and it's go back to why do you want to do this? Why now? You know, uh, these things were happening five, six, seven years ago. This, the inclusion didn't just start, the, the exclusion didn't start yesterday. So uh, one, again, acknowledging the history history and why we're in this situation and then finding out why are we asking these questions now why do you want to do these things now and when you can answer those and acknowledge those then we can move forward that's just my first few pieces of that yeah i would definitely want to definitely agree with all those points and i i kind of want to take it one step further too and acknowledging that the land that we all exist on here in central oregon is stolen land too uh, and it belonged to the confederated tribes of warm springs and so we don't own the outdoors and there tends to be this you know, narrative that people create and that kind of like goes back to this like, oh, like I, I own the land because and I get to use it however I want or it's mine. And this, I think that we have to like acknowledge one that we don't, we aren't the true owners of it. And also that, um, you know, in order to make spaces inclusive, we have to be willing to give something up and we have to be willing to change our behavior. We have to be willing to actually go out of our way to make it happen and so acknowledging why we want it but then also being like am i actually ready to give up something or to change something to make that happen and i think that that's kind of where we keep coming up to in these conversations it's like people will tune in and listen and be like yeah of course i want everyone to be able to access the outdoors but i don't have time to put accessibility information on my website or i don't have time to build a ramp to the bathroom because it, it's too much energy right now and there's probably not people that need it that many people that need it anyway so i think we really have to like challenge the why and then be really willing to do the work you know i think for me too it's all those things mentioned and then after that once you identify the why asking the, the communities um what it is that they need and asking or taking a look at the organizations that are existing even on this panel. I mean, there's a reason why they were created in the first place because they're, they're they're, they want to fill a need that is not there. And if organizations really want to do that work, ask them what are ways that they can help in or help better their organization to make them feel more inclusive. Or what, is, what do they need? What do the communities need? Um, and that takes a lot of time and effort. Um, yeah, I think that's... that's no, and I can I can expand on that a little bit. I feel that you know outdoor outdoors are very personal. We all have our personal perspective on on being outdoors. It's our own personal experience, um, and as has already been shown and discussed briefly, everyone's experience is different. And I think we have to get curious. We have to get curious with our community within our community about how Ashley's experience outdoors is different than Judith's, is different than Zavi's, or different than mine. We really need to understand that. Um, in order for us to really get a, 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 a clear perspective, if you will, of how to make um, the outdoors more inclusive. I mean, I don't, until Judith mentioned her experiences camping, you know, I, it's not the same experience that I would have. And I think it's important for us as a community to really recognize that and really understand that and have that conversation. Um, it's important for us to understand the needs, right, of all the different communities that want to experience the outdoors. I think too, like, Exactly. I think um, experiencing or at least understanding the different experiences of everybody and going back to like even the idea of it's doing the work. It's hard. Like it's going to take a lot of work. Like that's the reality of it. I think that like um, 
I was in a meeting earlier today and we were talking about um, this concept of these stages, um, this model that this lady was talking about, but these stages where first there's awareness and then there's, um, there's, there's an awareness of something and then there's an analysis. And oftentimes what we do is we have a, a glimpse of the awareness, not even a full awareness, but a glimpse of it. And then we go straight to action, allyship, all the things. And we don't really sit with the analysis, right? What does it take to dismantle systems in whatever environment that you're in or um, level of sphere, right? And so when I'm thinking about the outdoors, like that recognition and understanding the history, like you mentioned earlier, um, Jamie, about how there's not that much representation really necessarily in Oregon. That's why there's not a lot of people on the trails. Well, let's talk about why there's no representation in Oregon. Let's look at the history of Oregon, <laughs> right? Like it is so, I think oftentimes what we do is we want to like, we have a foundation in a house and what we want to do, and we can see this in the political realm as well too, but like we want to like fix the windows and let's, let's take this wall and let's break down this room over here, but we never look at the foundation in which the system was created on, right? And so we have to go back before we go and like try to change things within it right now. We have to go back and acknowledge what's going on. Why, why did we get here? You know, well, what's the reason? Oftentimes I always was like bottled by every time I try to ask my friends, let's go camping or let's go, my black friends, let's go camping, let's go hiking. I'm not doing that mess, that's white people stuff. And I used to be mad, I used to be mad at them. This is why white people take everything and do everything because y'all giving it away anyway. Until I had to like, oop, wait, I'm in my doctorate and I'm having, I'm doing like research and, 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 and just research work. And I had to really look at articles and writings of just like how nature and being in, like creates anxiety and fear for black folks and how that's so connected to trauma. <laughs> trauma related to racism, right? Death, lynching, what things and things have meanings for black folks. And so, and that like was like, okay, I can't, I need to stop being mad at my people. And I need to understand why they have the mentality that they have, the narrative that they have. And there has to be a healing process in that. So there needs to be changes in terms of policies and procedures and stuff like that, of course, Let's hold organizations accountable. Let's hold brands accountable. Let's hold all these different things accountable. At the same time, I'm as a mental health, I'm like, yeah, but we also have another situation. Like we have a narrative of trauma that is happening within people of color or people that identify as other that feel very fearful to be out in nature or to be and ex be exposed to certain things. And so um, so I'm, yeah, I want to, I want to just echo what Gordon talked about. We have to go back and revisit and like reheal. Like there's a healing process that has to happen and occur. Cause that's what happened to me. I had to get healed spiritually with being outdoors in a deep way that I can't expect other people and not just the BIPOC community, but even the LGBTQIA plus in terms of murders and abuse that had happened to certain people out in like excluded areas, if that makes sense. So yeah, there's something important to that. Yeah, Judith, I, I, I totally agree. I think uh, rapidly rushing into a new initiative or new program um, can come back and basically bite you on the rear end sometimes. It's not one size fit all when you're trying to figure out ways to increase inclusivity and diversity within a community. You really have to understand your immediate community like Judith said, like the history, like clearly Oregon's got a history, right? We all know. Um, and so we have to understand that we have to make programs and initiatives that are really in alignment um, with a clear understanding of what that history is, but also what the need, as I said earlier, what the needs of the community are. Trying to bring in a diversity program, for example, here is gonna be quite different than one that would be in Eugene or even in Salem, for example. Um, I think we need to be mindful of that. Thank you all. And, and as I mentioned in the beginning, this, this is a, a big chunk that we've decided to chew on for only an hour. And, and I so appreciate these ideas that you're bringing 
forward so that we can continue conversations onward as folks who are participating and, and watching today. I see some great things in the chat as well and, and know that these things are conversations that are gonna continue on much longer. With that, um, I think I'll move us to our, another question that was mentioned somewhat briefly in a couple of different ways here, this idea of, of seeing people like yourself or, or what we like to think of as representation in these outdoor spaces, being able to see the people that are in your group, see people like you. What does it mean for you, uh, speaking from your own personal experience, to be represented in outdoor spaces or in the media or advertisements? Um, so what does that mean for you, that idea of representation? And then why does that or, or does that not matter for you in this, in this time? Take as much time to think as you need. You know, it's funny, I was just reading this question before the panel and, and then I went on our OAS Instagram and someone messaged and was like, hey, I saw this sit ski. Do you think that I could do this? And kind of give a little synopsis of their scenario. And I was like, wow, like what a cool thing that social media and like our like diverse representation of photos on this feed made it possible for this person to be like, hey, I'd like to have an outdoor experience. Like maybe this is for me. And like that there, I was like, there's the answer to the question, right? Like until we see someone that looks like us or something that looks accessible or something that looks like what we're looking for, it's not really, it, we don't see ourselves in it and there's really not a good way forward there. And I, I think that one thing that's come up a few times in uh, just recent conversations is I think that we need to continue to see this like diverse representation in media as a intersectional thing. Like it's not like, oh, well, we're highlighting more people of color, so we'll get to people with disabilities next. You know, it's not like a checklist. Like, we really truly need to see diverse representation of all communities and all types. Um, and also, the, I think the biggest thing that's come up a lot in that conversation is when we're talking about like highlighting people in businesses and like for-profit companies, like we need to compensate people. Um, it's like absolutely ridiculous that people are still trying to get free services, free representation, be like, Hey, we'll highlight you for free. It's like, no, it's a service for people to show up. And um, I like, I can't believe that it's still coming up all the time, but yeah, intersectionality and compensating people. <laughs> yeah, I think the representation and then also, you know, holding people accountable, like talking about social media, I've had some accounts contact me and ask if I would, you know, do some things for them or be in their photos or something. And then I look at their, you know, their feed and it's all, you know, white, attractive, fit women. And I'm just like, no, like you have no interest in actually diversifying. Like, I'm not, not willing to participate in that. And it, it's really calling people out and being vocal about it is, is one thing that I've really learned and, and been you know, trying to do and have those uncomfortable conversations because they're, you know, they're not going to do it unless we hold them accountable. And it, and it seems simple, right? You know, you can say, well, put a, put a, put a couple pictures of black folks on your website, right? But that we all know the power of media, right? You know, the power of media has set up those stereotypes that, that depicts black people a certain way or people of color a certain way or, um, you know, disabilities a certain way. So we know the power of it. So it may sound simple, but yeah, I was on your website today. I didn't see any people of color, right? Um, I didn't find actually your equity and inclusion until later on down the line, which was really cool. I mean, what you wrote was great, but still that, that has some power, right? It has some meaning. And when you're a, a, a youth and you're looking for that, that, that person that you can connect to a peer or a mentor, and if you can go onto a website and you, and there's a person of color that's prominent, that's going to attract you to that. That's going to say, I'm, I see that, right? Okay. That's in a welcoming place. And so again, simple, you can call it tokenism, whatever you want to call it, but it carries an impact, right? Um, you know, uh, as far as I was, again, working with the Deschutes National Forest with Ally and Action, we, we actually put a slide up that had a map of the lands that were ceded, you know, by the Warren Springs people, right? And it, and it was basically looking at that map and showing the whole state of Oregon, but then breaking it down so, so the lands that Deschutes National Forest actually coordinates, right? Again, contrasted to those lands that were taken right and so and then but that was on their website that was an acknowledgement of that simple someone can type that in put the map on the website 
but that carries a lot of weight, at least in my opinion. I think that carries a lot of weight with that first impression, with that first look. If you're trying to attract people uh, of, of diverse backgrounds, you need to include it. It has to be prominent and not just the, the fifth bar down the checklist, right? I'd also add to that though, um, actually showing that you have invested in it because you know like the idea of tokenism if you just slap some stock photo of someone of color or someone in a wheelchair like we're gonna know you know most of the things out there with people with wheelchairs it's a wheelchair that none of it, nobody in the community would actually use and we're like yeah you you haven't spoken to anyone who actually uses a wheelchair or has a disability and i'm sure that goes in all the other directions as well like we can spot it we know what's authentic and what is just just to make us think that you you're trying and you're not and i think we can't rely on the national sporting industry to really spearhead that i think our best efforts are done locally um i feel you know let's let's get bachelor you know they do an amazing job at promoting through media youth for example right they have an amazing youth program that definitely attracts youth um, well, why can't they do the same to reflect a more diverse and inclusive um, uh, uh, customers or whatever? Um, and the same with like Visit Ben. You know, we at Central Oregon's work with Visit Ben to really um, open up the world's eyes that Ben is welcoming to at least the LGBTQ community. Um, but you know, their promotional materials can reflect more diversity as well. And I think that's just a conversation that you just reach out to them and say, hey, like let's. Let's talk about this. How can we make this happen again at a much at a local level? I think larger retailers will start taking notice um, to that stuff as well. Um, if I had it, so I love what you guys are saying. It's so refreshing in this space right now. Um, and I'm thinking about too, like for my job. Um, I I know. I mean, I'm the only black therapist right now in the field of wilderness therapy, just in wilderness therapy, not mental health outdoors, but wilderness therapy, um, cause it's an umbrella within itself. But, um, and we serve, I mean, it's, it's not a very high percentage, but um, we serve BIPOC community here in wilderness therapy. And majority of my clients are of color and there's a high percentage of them just, just transracial adoption, just in itself. Um, that's a lot of my clientele. And I see how representation, like how much representation matters when the moment that these kids, I mean, they're in treatment, they're, they're in the wilderness and they're getting treatment. Um, and when they see a person that looks like them come into the field and says, I'm gonna be your therapist. It's like, I have heard so many times and I get emails so much by the end of their treatment when they are like, Judith, thank you so much for this and this and this. And it's like a breath of fresh air because wilderness therapy is predominantly white and it looks a certain way. That's my staff. That's who love my staff, love them. I have amazing friendships in that. And also this is what it looks like all the time. And so oftentimes I don't see, I don't see myself there and I know that my kids don't see themselves in there. And so they are in this process of assimilation as well too. And that's, that's in any wilderness program. And so um, so I realized so much how much representation matters down to like hair care, skin care, like all the things I am going to look at that. And I'm going to always acknowledge that because I'm a person of color, like that's my life. And so I'm understanding all the different facets and layers of that. And so, and that representation connects to their mental health on so many different levels. And that's what I see more and more is connected to their self-esteem they're connected to the way that they view themselves, beauty and all the such, acceptance, being seen, being heard and that kind of stuff. And so to me, representation has a lot to do with our mental health in a lot of ways. Um, I especially think for kids, if they are gonna, if we wanna teach them how to love nature and love the outdoors in whatever way that means to them, I think it's so important for us, for them to see representation in people that look like them out there because it's super, it's, it's life-giving in a lot of ways. And so, yeah. I love that you're reflecting too on a, kind of like another kind of representation that we don't always jump to. Like sometimes I think the first thing we go to is representation in the media, 
but I like the representation at like a instructor at a field guide level, at an authority level. And that's something that we've had a lot of conversations about in our organization is how do we invite people, you know, from all sorts of backgrounds into our space? Well, the people that are volunteering, that are instructing, like those people also have to be inclusive or have to be a more diverse group. And so who is our instructor team? And is it actually a diverse group of people? Because like you said, that representation at the, you know, at the like instructing level is just as critical as at the like participant level. I just want to echo that too. That's, I think that's, that's huge. You know, having the, a community reflect who you're offering programs to, I think to Judith's point of even the like hair products. Like for me today, I did a program, like one of the boys was like, um, you like chilaquiles, you know, like this type of food. And it's like, yeah, like, of course, like, I love it. And like to them, like, that's so small, but that goes such a long way for the community of like representation and to get everything that everyone else said. And another thing that I'm personally trying to do with like pr programs that I'm doing is like reshape shaping and changing that narrative that we've talked about and having that visual or like having that represented as well. Like just being in the park, having a picnic, eating food, gathering together, like that's outdoors. We're outside in nature spaces. We don't have to do these extreme, um, they're great, like rock climbing. Like, you know, that's kind of scary for some folks, but that, that narrative, those things, especially like in this area, I feel get perpetuated. Um, which again, there's nothing wrong with those things. Those are great things to do. And if you can do that, like that, that's great. But again, not a lot of people resonate with that. And that, and Ben especially gets, again, perpetuated and represented kind of always of like, you know, look at this awesome thing that like I can do or like that some, that this person did. Like it's great, but not a lot of people resonate with that. And that in itself could act as a barrier because like, that's not me. I can't do that. So then this, the outdoors is not for me. Mm. Yeah, that's something that I have been thinking about yesterday and everything is the, the extreme and how we're always highlighting the extreme instead of the beginners, like someone commented here. And I was thinking about a lot of the conferences that I've gone to and the keynote speakers. They're always some inspiring story by some white guy who overcame something because he had like, you know, some minor injury or something. And it's like, really, you know, and it, it's always turned into this inspiration porn type of thing slash like he's so extreme. And, you know, it's something that none of us can relate to. And I don't know why we're so drawn to that. Um, you know, I think it pushes all of us away and creates this culture of, of all of us like competing with each other because we want to be extreme instead of just, you know, being stoked for each other because we're doing what makes us happy. Like, I don't go out on the slope to be the fastest or anything i go to have fun and like let's just have fun you know so that's a big one for me i love that i know i read that with aaron when she talked about the beginners and i'm like yes I, when i went backpacking we did like um a lake there and it was near south sisters and everybody that was backpacking up there too like that we me us girls just sat we spent the whole day the next day by the lake we turned it into a lake day we just like, it was like, we're at a beach and we're just gonna spend the whole day while everybody else is talking about, did you summit South Sister? No, I don't feel like summiting South Sisters. I wanna hike to a lake and I wanna stand, I wanna sit and lay in the sand in front of the green water. That's all I wanna do. And is that okay? But there was this, even this like, this unsettled like covert message of like, oh, you hiked all the way up here and you didn't do the summit. And it's like, no, I don't, I don't care about summiting right now, you know? so. I, yeah, I definitely want to echo that. Like there is this, this narrative and this idea that we must do these extremes. Um, there's an initiative, the Mama's, Mama's Adventure Initiative, and it's a nonprofit for mothers who are adventuring. And I remember there was a talk, there was a conversation where they were talking about that. Like some moms, they're moms. They can't, their adventuring looks so different. And it doesn't look like these like three week backpacking trips or these like summiting, you know what I mean? And and for them, it's going for a hike. It's, it's, it's just going to the park even, and that's nature and sitting on the, on the grass and spending time out there. And so, or taking their, you know, taking their baby out in the stroller and going for a walk um, around the park and that's okay. And so I think we really do have to like diversify the narrative of what nature looks like for people because nature looks differently. Like I have kids who are from New York City and nature for them is playing basketball on the basketball court. And doing that with their boys and their like you know in the hood even you know so and that's okay and so when, when they come to us where wilderness therapy is more on the like extreme side but i have to constantly talk about like how can what's nature to you where you go because if i don't do that then they don't they're not aware consciously of that they're actually participating in nature events they 
separate it and go, that was this extreme thing that I did over there and I'll never get a chance to do something like that or feel the same way that I felt being disconnected or being in tuned or practicing mindfulness practices, right? As it relates to nature. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's super important for us to change the narrative around nature. And we can do that through our social media. We can do that through the way that we talk about it. We can even do that through the way that we dressed even. Like I like to wear sneakers to go out. To the field. I don't need to wear chacos every time I go out into the wilderness. Why? Why can't I just wear some high tops? <laughs> I'm passionate <laughs> about this, but yeah. Oh, I love what you were saying there too. And also I think like, like you said, dropping the like language that we used to talk about it, right? Like I, so often we see people like making fun of how other people, you know, what other people are wearing or, you know, Jerry of the day or, you know, whatever. But like, that's a great starting point. Like, am I making fun of other people? Am I maybe, are my, are my word choices like, you know, negatively impacting someone else? Like that's a very actionable item. And it, it comes up a lot, you know, if someone feels like they have to be a certain way to go outside, they might not go outside. Uh, and I, I think I remember specifically like my first summer in Bend, like people had started to come in for the summer and I had no idea how busy it got in the summer. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many people on the river. And my friend looked at me and was like, yeah, but think about how many people are having their first ever river experience right now. And I was like, oh yeah. And so I think we, it's really easy to get caught up in like, oh, it's so busy and I don't want to share all the spaces. Um, but if we really want to create an inclusive outdoor environment, we have to share the spaces. And how cool is it that we get to? So uh, I'm going to go back to history again and access, right? You know, we talk about who has, who has traditionally had access to the outdoors too, right? And what that means is part of when we're talking about the gear, right? Or the, the, the right bike, right? Or that type of stuff. A lot of times when you're in a social economic position to not afford that type of stuff. And so that's a barrier as well, too, when you think about the, the Patagonia jackets, again, the type of stuff that we've been talking about. And when you see that as part of that norm of what you're supposed to wear, that's, that's a barrier. That's the folks that are not going to be able to do that, given, again, the access and the privilege that's not there to be able to afford those types of things. And uh, I used to be a heavy mountain biker. I lived in Nevada for about five years and I got to bend. I've been in Bend for 20 years. I've ridden a mountain bike twice. Some of it's my fault, but that initial thing was I, I got out on Phil's trail and people have a thousand dollar bikes. You know, I've had the same bike I had for since 1995, right? It did me fine in 1995. I didn't need a thousand dollars. But, but again, going on that same thing of access, privilege, ability to, to use these resources um, is, is, is critical to look at how we can get into that. Thanks all. And as a reminder for, for all of our folks who are listening in before we jump into our final questions, uh, these panelists aren't all just, just talk. They are all here because they're, they're doing the work, showing up in, in their spaces and um, we'll be sure to share their information and, and the work that they're doing so that you can connect with them on the ways that they are addressing um, and, and showing up for some of these things that they've shared today. Our last couple of questions, I'm going to shoot them both at you so then I can just take a back seat to listen in. Um, one is a large question. Uh, how do you envision the future of our outdoor spaces in Central Oregon? Um, and if you don't feel like you can tackle such a large question, um, I would love to hear how you could either encourage folks who want to be active allies in these outdoor spaces or how you want to send some encouragement to folks who are in your affinity spaces, your, your groups. Um, so either that vision for the future um, or an encouragement piece that you'd like to, to send. We have just about 10 more minutes. I'll go on the encouragement piece here. I, well, my, my vision for the future is a world where everyone gets the benefits of outdoor recreation regardless of ability straight from OAS vision so um but truly like where the barriers are broken down where OAS doesn't exist anymore where all of our organizations don't even have to exist because the work has been done long ways out but it's my my dream vision uh, but my piece of encouragement is that the good news is, is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel there are so many organizations doing work 
in this community, you might think Bend is too small to have all that happening, but it's happening. There are all these people here that can be a resource and that are available to talk about it. So if you want to talk about accessibility in the outdoors, call OAS. There are people already doing the work and all you have to do is reach out authentically and like there are people that can help with this work. So. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll follow you um, on that. I, I agree. I think uh, there are a lot of organizations and, and individuals here in Central Oregon and in Bend that are really trying, you know, really trying to make some headways and make some changes within, within, within our community. You know, my message or my ask is like support, support those organizations, um, the local ones, um, you know, ask, have a discussion with them. If you have an idea, give them a call and say, hey, I have this idea for an event or for a concept or for a, a discussion, a panel discussion. I mean, us in Oregon would jump at any new ideas. We, we love it. We can't think of everything. Um, so we want those ideas to come in. And I think that's a really great place to start. The other is like follow them on social media. I mean, I know, you know, it, it's the world we live in, but expanding their message through your expansion of their social media efforts can really make a difference. I mean, I think that visibility is really important because with visibility comes understanding, empathy, um, and, and familiarity. I think a lot of times people respond to differences um, in other people just because they've, they've never seen it before. Um, and you can't blame them for their ignorance, if I can, if I can say it that way. Um, but you know, get get some familiarity going and, and spread the word that way. And then also um, encourage companies. And and again, I'll I'll stick it with like encourage local companies to get involved. You know, encourage REI for example. And I don't know if they do this or not, but encourage them to go to the Latino Festival, for example, and have a booth there, and not just at you know Ben Fall Festival, for example. Encourage other businesses so that that really reflects that the local businesses. Um, I want to be part of this this change and this movement, if you want to if you want to call it that. That's that's my perspective. For me, I love all those things, and I think I want to come back to the point of like reaching out to like some of us uh, potentially, or, like people who are kind of leading this work. I think that's I think that's great, but I think that's also a big ask. I also want to just kind of express like doing own research, like to um, Jamie's point of like, there's a lot of, you know, social media stuff out there, like other folks in the community doing a lot of different work um, to um, get an understanding like of yourself and, and why you want to learn more about this inclusivity. Um, and I think going on, I'll start right there actually. Oh, you can't stop there, man. You were going on, come on, Zavi. I don't want to take up too much. There's a lot of there's a lot of us, and I've 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 done stuff like in other por um, panels. That I want to give like everyone oh, else. That's like, important to say. Say it, brother. Now you're All right, I'll tell you, I'll take the time. So I think again, I'll go back. I'll reiterate. Understand your why. Why do you want to do these things? I can't tell you. I've been asked to sit on seven different boards in the last year, right? And I have to check why. Why are you asking me? Is it because George Floyd died? Is it, I mean, there's plenty of other black folks who died several years ago, right? So ask yourself the why. Why are we doing this work now? Why do you really want to do this? Acknowledge your history. Understand your history. Why we're in this position. Why we have to ask this why. And the other thing I'll say is that kind of tagging on to, you know, what Zavi's doing. I know what he's doing. You know, what, what Judith is doing out there in the wilderness training. There's a, there's a national group that's growing called Outdoor Afro that is really focusing on African Americans out in the, in the wilderness and getting outside, not just camping for a month, but, you know, like just getting to the park. So some of the work falls to us in our communities, right? And we're doing some of that, right? There are, I just said three of us right now in this room that are doing some of that work. So use those resources as well too, right? Because some of it falls to us. Savi and Judith to make sure that we're connecting with our communities to do some of this too. So that, I'll leave that at that. Thank you. And I'll just follow that up too. I think long-term as far as like a solution, like this might seem like extreme, but to me, this is kind of the lens that I have when I do the work of like getting like Latinx communities outdoors is with like my programs is how can I put myself out of a position, like out of a job, like really like how, when is it to where like Vamanos outside is no longer needed or Latino outdoors is no longer needed. Like again, there's a reason and I just want to speak for myself like that I started like those those like programs here for a reason. 
Um, but again, when is it, are we to a place where those are no longer needed, where it's just embedded within organizations, when it's embedded already in Mount Bachelor? Not to say they're not doing it and making works and not like calling anybody out. But again, this has examples like when is it that the Forest Service no longer needs, you know, to partner with these organizations that have started and are doing this work because they have maybe not seen it done and they're not catering to their communities that they reflect and or are a part of. Um, so again, that's kind of like my lens when I do this work. Um, but as far as from a, the outside looking in, I think just getting to know these organizations to then at least again, like put me at a position like to where I am no longer needed or within these programs are no longer needed to that where you're doing it already on behalf of your individual organization. And I'll just add on to that too. I hear a lot and Ben like, oh, but it doesn't really seem like it's that big of a problem here. Um, and all of our organizations exist because there are barriers to the outdoors. So when Zavi says that he doesn't need a job anymore, uh, doing bominous, uh, then, it, then it's resolved. But until then, you have to believe that like all of us are here for a reason. I want a job. I want to make that clear. I don't want to like not like work. I mean, you know, like I'm very thankful and grateful for that opportunity. But I mean, you, you see what I'm saying? Like the organization itself, like hopefully someone, I get a job somewhere else. But I have, I have one more comment. I'm sorry, Jamie, Jamie or anyone else wants to speak, but one more comment. I've heard a lot and a couple of times tonight and in the last few months that we have, and it's true, we have a, a small demographic of people of color, but we're here. We are here. Don't forget that. I mean, it, and it's, it's really larger than you may think it is. I mean, I've heard that so many times. You can look at the stats and the numbers, but we're here. That You can look in this room right now, right? We're here. And so please don't forget that. It, we're, it, it, we, we're either invisible or we stick out like a sore thumb, but our numbers are growing and we are, we are here and we're staying. So I think that's a great point, Gordon. And just really quickly, and I know Judith, I think you may want to say something, but, you know, Ben is considered one of the best outdoor communities in the nation, right? Um, so I think we have an opportunity to be a real role model to other rural communities across the nation um, to really make change. Um, that's definitely part of how OutCentral Oregon looks at our efforts. Um, and I think, you know, all of us together can, can really make that happen. And I think we should look at it through those lenses. Um, yeah. Also, too, I think it, it's tiring to do this job for all of us. Um, it's a it's a lot of work, and there's something to like. I have to constantly hold myself and hold the BIPOC community that I'm connected to, um, like not accountable, but more so supporting them in. Hey, let's check in with ourselves and take care of ourselves because we need it. Um, I think we live in a society and a culture where we work, we're task oriented, like very much work. And I'm going to be bold enough to say white America are very task oriented. Like let's do, like we're on a mission. Um, and that tends to be the narrative in the culture. And so what I think the biggest thing is that again, going back to awareness and a deep analysis and be okay with that. The deep analysis sometimes doesn't require you doing taking a break on the action for a little bit. I mean, we need action, we need changes. I totally get that, we do. And also like, what does deep analysis look like? So get therapy, get therapy, get therapy. Because I think that no matter who you are, when you're processing and really looking at the problems that we are facing in our country, that we have been facing and the reality of it, there's a lot of trauma. We're seeing trauma left and right on TV, on everything, even the way that we are approaching with our friends, we're seeing trauma. And so I cannot reiterate it enough, like get therapy, take the time to sit with some of the stuff that's coming up before you jump into action. Because a lot of times we lead from a place of trauma, unfortunately, and then there are people that are being impacted by that. So super, super important. I know we are running against that 6.30 timeline that I warned us about when it was coming for us. Ashley, I do want to make sure that if you have anything else you'd like to add, you have a space to add that. I understand if folks do have to step off, um, but Ashley, please. Um, I guess I did just want to mention one more thing that I kind of skimmed over while we're talking about represent or not, well, representation, but also holding people accountable, not just media and all of that, but land managers are very important. And I think we kind of tend to forget about like the designers, all of those people, my backgrounds in architecture. And, you know, it's 
ADA isn't taught very well. Learning about your user group is not taught very well. Like there's no psychology or sociology that people learn about when they're learning design. And so I think really need to take that holding people accountable, accountable like media may need to take it a step further and be looking at the people that are directly in charge of these things. And like right now I'm working on an accessibility toolkit for land managers. And so I'm trying to give them the tools to make things more accessible without focusing on ADA because that's, that's not like the golden rule for accessibility. And people just kind of think it, it's a box to check, you know, and, um, you know, a lot of us know people that work for state parks or Ben Park and Rec, you know, in this community, it's, it's pretty tight. And so we know people that have control over these spaces. So we need to be having those conversations with them and be pushing them and be advocating for things to change for, you know, their, their power structures to change for who they're bringing in and how they're designing to change in all of these ways. Um, and so that's, that's a big one, I think, for me, is, is really pressure everywhere, <laughs> everyone talking about it. Yeah, we can't stop. We got to keep the pressure on. You're right. You're right. Keep the pressure. One of the, sorry, one of the, the one things that I, I keep thinking about when you're talking about tokenism and all the committees you've been asked to be on, like, same so many committees to the point where I really want to get this big flashy necklace that just says token and like every time I get to the table I want to just take it off and like set it down like every time I go to the bathroom just like just like you know a little bit of flair and like somewhat of an artistic maybe passive aggressive I don't know but I think it'd be pretty entertaining I uh, oh I that's such a great conversation, I think, to have to like this this conversation of like being asked to be on board because I've always like that same thing or committees of like it's tokenism, but at the same time it's like it needs to be a start. Like maybe I'm a start, but am I okay with being tokenized? Like yes, no, but I am. I need to hold space for like myself and you know my mental health and like all these different like nuances of like of like it probably is, but like it needs to start, it needs to happen. It's not gonna happen. Like I don't know. It's just again, it's just interesting dilemma at least for myself of like it's a great opportunity, but is it for what reason? Right. And it's just like, I'm always being asked. And it's like, for what? I know why. <laughs> if yeah. I don't do it, who's going to do it, right? I feel yeah, like I'm getting a chance now. Like, I, sh I should, but it's like capacity to them. It's like, uh. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's my way of like making it okay or just, you know, calling it out, like validating myself in that space. Having make, some make two, make two. I'll, 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 I'll wear one with you. <laughs> I'll make one for all of you. Yes, I want one. I want one of those for sure. Give me one. Set us up. <laughs> well, I want to say, you know, we are at the six thirty point, and this is a great roll into the conversation. You know, this piece can be effective if it continues into further conversations, continues into further dialogue, contemplation, um, and spaces. I know, uh, as folks at the land trust here are, are listening tonight, um, and and that's why we are here. That's why I am here. Um, I had to do a little talking because we have a timeline, but uh, I, I want to extend a, a massive thank you to all of the folks who are um, able to share their experiences to, to really sit and think on these questions. These are not easy questions, and I wanted to extend that thank you to you all as um, panelists today. I know that this is not the first panel for many of you, and, and that is a big undertaking. I also wanted to extend a thank you for everyone who came to listen. Uh, a conversation has two pathways and, and it only works if we're listening. So thanks everyone for, for showing up, uh, spending the hour, hour and four minutes to listen. Um, knowing that you're here is, is a piece of hope. So we'll be sharing additional resources, like I mentioned, information um, and information about the work that folks on the panel are doing within our community. We would love to hear from you in our follow-up email. You'll have uh, space to contact the Land Trust um, and space to contact myself personally as well. Uh, we hope to see you on the trail. We hope to see you at another virtual event. Um, if you would like to get to know some more about the Land Trust or the other virtual events we have coming up, uh, feel free to subscribe, follow, all of the things. Uh, I hope you all have a, a good night. Stay well, um, and thank you again. Thank you, everyone, fellow, pa fellow panelists. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to contact you soon. I'm going to get together. Nice to meet everybody.